A once secret air base in the Nevada desert is marking an unofficial anniversary today. <laughs> Area 51 was one of the most secretive places on the planet, but that anonymity vanished forever because of what happened 25 years ago. A controversial electronics whiz told a fantastic tale during a TV interview, and the story still reverberates today. The I-team's George Knapp played a part in what became an international sensation. He's here with an update. Uh, setting stage, Dave, you might not know this, but uh, 25 years ago, a young anchor woman <laughs> named Paula Francis and I were prepping for the 5 o'clock news when we learned that our scheduled live interview had canceled. We placed a call to aviator John Lear to ask if he could get a friend of his to fill the spot, a guy who reportedly worked out near Area 51 and had seen flying saucers out there. It sounded outrageous at the time, but that interview with Bob Lazar turned Area 51 upside down. We coaxed a reluctant Lazar into returning to Las Vegas to talk about it. I don't know. Sometimes I really do regret it, regret it and almost... I, I almost feel like apologizing to him, saying that, you know, I'm sorry I let things out. Can I have my job back? 25 years after he was forever transformed into Bob the UFO guy, Bob Lazar says he regrets ever talking about flying saucers or a secret base in the Nevada desert or any of the things that made his name known all over the world. There isn't a day I, I don't get emails and, you know, I try and get this across to him. Look, I don't even want to talk about it anymore. You know, well, I don't believe the story. Great, pass it around. <laughs> you know, I really don't want you to because it makes life difficult for me. A quarter century ago, not many people outside of Nevada had ever heard of Area 51, the mysterious base 100 miles north of Las Vegas, a place the government said didn't exist. It was the location of choice for all manner of black projects, spy planes that were kept secret from the public. And that's my driveway, that's Bob, that's Gene Huff, and uh, Bob's wife Tracy and Chris, and uh, we're just waiting there for uh, 5 o'clock to roll around. Former CIA pilot John Lear remembers the day that Area 51 became a household name. This is home video he shot as a KLAS news truck prepared to broadcast a live interview from Lear's home. Lazar was understandably nervous. Yeah, he was nervous because he was putting it all out on the line there, and uh, here he was going to you know, reveal all this secret that he'd signed, you know, that he was going to uh, never tell anybody. It's uh, not only a crime against the American people. It's a In the interview, the Lazar's community. face was hidden, and he used a pseudonym, Dennis, which was the first name of his boss out in the desert. Well, there's several, uh, actually nine, uh, flying saucers. Flying Lazar claimed he worked intermittently at a location called S-4, south of Groom Lake, the main facility of Area 51. He said the hangars had been built into the side of a mountain disguised as desert, and inside were a set of nine flying saucers. Months later, he revealed his identity to the world and said the technology he'd worked on was from somewhere else, that it was being taken apart to figure out how it worked. The reason that they're round and have no sharp edges is to contain the high voltage. When you get yourself in position... The information exploded like a bomb, area, and in the quarter century since then, the world has beaten a path to Area 51's door. Every major news organization in the world has written stories. The base has inspired documentaries and TV dramas. Dozens of books have been written, fiction and nonfiction, hundreds of news articles, many of them critical of Lazar and skeptical about his background. His tale launched a thousand product lines, every trinket you can imagine, along with assorted businesses, a AAA baseball team, and the world's only extraterrestrial highway running right past the entrance to Groom Lake. Uh, when you president, president Obama we'll recently made a point of publicly acknowledging Area 51. Uh, what's really going on at Area 51? And former President Bill president, Clinton told Jimmy Kimmel he'd looked into those stories about space aliens. So first I had people go look at the records on Area 51 to make sure there was no alien down there. Even the Kardashians have made a trek out into the desert. That's a security guard. Look, look how that... that uh, you know, that story moved throughout the internet so quickly. And not just the internet, but, but news in itself. Like it was in the first 48 hours after the broadcast, it was in Japan. Back in Las Vegas for a visit, Lazar recalls why he came forward in the first place. He had traveled to the S-4 base only a handful of times, but began to get scared. I began to get worried in that, boy, they've given me all this classified information they're not calling me anymore. They won't take my phone calls. And in the meantime, apparently, they're deciding what 
to do with me. Look at how bright it's getting. Look at it now. For a variety of personal reasons, Lazar couldn't keep the story to himself. He shared his tale with John Lear and Gene Huff. They and a few others made treks out to the outskirts of S-4 because Lazar said he'd learned when the test flights of the saucer would take place. Three weeks in a row, a glowing object appeared over the mountain. Look at how bright it's getting. Look at it now. And just a few minutes ago, we saw one of the government uh, uh, extraterrestrial UFOs. The time when Bob said there would be a test, there was a strange light jumping around in the sky above the location where he said it would be at the time and date he said it would be. You know, here, the craft took off when I said it was taking off from past the, the mountain range, which was Papoose Lake, S4, south of Area 51, you know, in a restricted area. So it's not like anyone was out there with a model plane or anything. And, uh, you know, flew around in incredible maneuvers that impressed everybody to the point where we got scared and got behind a, a, a car, fearing the thing was going to explode. But um, really, how do you explain it? It's bright right now. Lazar has more than his share of critics, including the poobahs of the UFO community who think he made it up. And he has holes in his background that have yet to be filled. But to date, no one has yet been able to explain how he knew those test flights would take place out there. Tonight at 11, we tag along as Lazar takes a tour of the Area 51 Museum exhibit that his story inspired. And over the next few days, we'll be adding material to our website, including the original series that we broadcast and some extended excerpts from this most recent interview. You remember that day? Oh, yeah. Backed off those original claims? No, no. Really Sa tells the same story right, right now. There yeah. you go. I saw a clip of our interview in Amsterdam in 1997. <laughs> Never <laughs> that dies. That was a shock. <laughs> great job then and great job now, yeah, George. Thanks, George. At 11, with Paula Francis and Dave Cravassier. The news of Southern Nevada is now. It's been 25 years to the day since a live interview with a shadowy guy named Dennis changed everything for America's most secret military base. Dennis turned out to be a Las Vegan named Bob Lazar, who claimed to work at a secret facility built into a mountainside just south of Area 51. The story started a UFO stampede that continues to this day. Lazar has tried to put the flying saucer stories behind him and has been discredited in the eyes of some critics, but it is a story that simply won't go away. We coaxed Lazar into talking about the last quarter century of UFO craziness. The I-Team's George Knapp has the story. What better way to unwind after a long day than a glass of Groom Lake red wine from the Ailey Inn? Maybe spend a few minutes staring at the paintings you picked up at the Area 51 art show, while perhaps listening to the Bob Lazar music video. The story that Bob Lazar told 25 years ago this week has gone around the world many times over, inspiring books and TV shows and movies. Who knew that Indiana Jones Warehouse is at Area 51? That sound you hear means Agent Black will be waiting for you. You're too nice. <laughs> Another repository of Area 51 lore is the exhibit at the Atomic Testing Museum. While in town recently for our interview, <laughs> Lazar took the tour. I guess I have to get a picture of that, too. It was a little surreal watching Bob Lazar as he saw tape of the first interviews he ever gave about his time working at S-4. Later, as we plowed through boxes of paperwork about his claims, Lazar reiterated his preference that people don't believe his story. Look. I am not out there giving UFO lectures, producing tapes. I, this is not a business of mine. I am trying to run a scientific business. Um, and if I'm the UFO guy, it makes it really difficult. It's to my benefit that people don't believe the story. I These days, Lazar and his wife operate a scientific supply firm in Michigan. He's received media coverage because of the odd stuff he sells online, but not everyone has made the connection to Area 51 and the stampede he started back in 1989 when he told of working at S4 south of Area 51, where he saw flying saucers so advanced they had to be from somewhere else. This is a model of the reality reactor, he says, was able to generate its own gravitational field, powered by what he called element 115. Barry turned on the reactor, which was a flat plate and half of a basketball, essentially, on it, just a uh, hemisphere. And once it was uh, activated, you could not touch the sphere. You put your, put your hand on it, and just like the uh, light poles of a magnet, the exact same type of force. He had a, a little 
golf ball and you know we dropped it on it and you know it never hit the sphere and fell off and then you know you we threw it at it and it rebounded and knocked the ceiling knocked tile the ceiling out of place tile. but that was uh that it that alone is something amazing look that can change everything we know today. The story exploded among it's UFO researchers leave, and just as quickly led to questions and denouncements. The I-team confirmed Lazar had previously worked at Los Alamos National Lab, but we also reported his claimed education credentials could not be proven. UFO experts, including physicist Stan Friedman, also dug into his background. I say, here's a bright guy. I did a lot of checking on him. I find a lot of things didn't check out. That doesn't mean I disagree with everything he ever said or that he was a liar all the time. It means that I can't buy the story as presented. What all he did out there, I don't know. Lazar says there's no end to the questions, and even if he could prove he worked at S4, someone would say he must have been the janitor. So he generally avoids the topic altogether. Oh, you just, do you want some of the fame? What the fame? You know, there's no big dump truck dropping money off at my house every Thursday night. There's no, I'm not out for any fame. I really have better things to do. Generally, people have to twist my arm to come out and do things like that. As you know, you're the arm twister. <laughs> Those who were around him at the time the story broke or took the trips into the desert to see the craft fly above S4 say, you really had to be there. Did you see that move it There's a MUFON moron that calls me every once in a while and he says, we well, don't still believe that guy, do you? And I say, I lived it. it. The whole two years, it was fantastic. It was one of the greatest times of my life. He wouldn't go through the trouble to make up a story to lie to people and then perpetuate that lie. Bob has no idea who won the Super Bowl or the World Series last year, do you? I mean, he's busy doing scientific stuff in, in the Bob Lazar world. He, he wouldn't waste his time perpetrating a lie on anyone. Look, I know what happened is true. There's no doubt, period. Lazar was known to have unconventional interests and a spotty financial record, so why would a top-secret program let him in? One theory is that maybe someone predicted he would spill the beans and was chosen because they wanted the UFO story to be planted. Lazar told us he can't rule that out entirely. We're putting together a special Area 51 section on our website, and we'll be adding material to it over the next few days, including extended excerpts with the most recent interview. And by the way... The Area 51 exhibit is having a grand reopening this Saturday. That alone is something amazing. Look, that can change everything we know today. Just having a machine to produce artificial gravity. Because look, look at what that does. We know gravity, space, and time are all tied together. There are your shields, like on Star Trek, that you know deflect micrometeorites. There is your protection from radiation without heavy shielding. There is something that with an intense enough focused field, you can actually bend space, and there is something that can actually alter the flow of time. I mean, that's the missing piece of pie. Didn't they actually freeze a, a, a flame, candle? A flame for yeah, you. now that's when it was connected to the gravity amplifiers where they could focus it, and uh, that they, was... They froze a candle? A flame yeah, they, flame. Had a, they had a candle lit uh, to set it up for you. Um, again, there's a large, in the craft itself, there are three long pipes. Um, I'd say, uh, well, I don't know about what's that? It's three, four feet in diameter, maybe f five feet long. Um, anyway, they dangle the three of them at the bottom of the craft. These produce gravitational waves, and they can focus them to a point or spread them apart. Those um, are what you call the wave guides? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. They're part of the. Uh, power source control mechanism and the uh, wave, well, the waveguide is what I actually call the interlink between them, but that, that's the gravitational engine. Um, they had one of those devices out along with the subsystem that connects it. So they can produce the power from the reactor, it runs the gravity amplifier, and they can focus and change the gravity beam that comes out of it. They took, uh, they were Speaking of Barry, took a candle, put it close to the mouth of it, lit it a normal flickering candle flame, and then activated the reactor. The gravity wave came out as expected, and the candle flame remained luminous 
and stopped moving. And Which defies I mean, physics. Yeah, because look, if it's going to freeze it, the photon should stop being emitted. If it's going to you know, change the characteristics. Look, how can the combustion continue to take place without the convection inside the flame? Because actually, the reason a flame is elongated is not, not really because of the heat. It's because of gravity. Because gravity pulls down and you know, convection moves flames upward. It's why in, in a zero gravity environment, flame is a ball. Obviously, there's nothing to pull things around. But anyway, if uh, look, if you negate the gravity around it, why is it still pointy? How can it still be making light? And why doesn't it move? Well, I mean, he, from what Barry said, it's not just gravity, but it's also time locked. You've they distorted froze the a frame of time. Yeah, they right? essentially froze a, a piece of time there. And I, you know, what do you say? I mean, you're it's empirical evidence. You're looking at it's it. It's not. It's that not you a. Can see it. It doesn't make sense that you could see it. And uh, look, it, it, the stuff I saw there was the most unbelievable, literally, because it, it, it defied what, what we knew as physics. And uh, at least I thought it did. And maybe what we knew was <laughs> a little incorrect and just needed viewing from a different angle. They finally did uh, synthesize element 115 that had the properties that I that I stated. Um, not, um, but it wasn't stable. Yeah, it wasn't stable. Uh, now, each element has isotopes. For instance, you know, let's talk about hydrogen. We're all familiar with hydrogen. Uh, hydrogen has three isotopes. They're all hydrogen. There's hydrogen, protium, was the, be the technical name, deuterium, and tritium. Well. Tritium is a radioactive hydrogen. Uh, deuterium is another stable isotope of hydrogen. And regular protium, ordinary hydrogen, is the hydrogen we all know. They're all hydrogen. They have different amounts of neutrons in them. Um, they all have one proton, which makes them hydrogen. Now, this is true for all elements. You can have the amount of protons in them determines what element it is. So element 115 has 115 protons in it. It's element 115. Now, depending on the number of neutrons it has, it will still be element 115, but it can be any number of isotopes of it. 115 undoubtedly has you know, many isotopes of it. We've synthesized 115. We made one isotope. We have a radioactive one. Now they just need to continue on working with it. I mean, they made just a few atoms, but uh, we'll see what other isotopes they come up with. One of them or more is going to be stable and it will have the exact properties that or, I said. Or could we make it? Or does it have to be natural? As you speculated well, about that. Well, before. it's natural. It'd be difficult to find it. I, I do not think you can make that synthetically. It's just, it takes too much time. I mean, to make you know, an ounce of it or even a gram would take a tremendous amount of time because not all the interactions are successful. I mean, you can bang particles together all day long and one may get stuck and then you've got an atom and how do you contain, you know, this single atom? So how do we get 500 pounds of it? Where'd that come from? Well, it, it, it had to either be uh, synthesized by the extraterrestrials that bought it in the first place or, you know, maybe there was a, a location where they came from where Look, this was a naturally occurring material. We know that all the material in the universe, essentially all the atoms of all elements, came from hydrogen. I mean, all you really need is, it, it is just atoms of hydrogen to make anything. Once they start collecting together large quantities of them, gravity just begins to push them together under their own weight. As long as you have enough hydrogen, that'll continue until they finally crush down and ignite and produce a fusion reaction and that starts a star. Once the star is burning it begins to produce helium by fusing so now you have another new element. Well this continues on until the star burns out, begins to collapse and when you know large enough stars finally do they crush down, produce supernovas and then produce a whole host of every element on the periodic chart far beyond what we're the, the numbers we're used to, beyond 115, 
and you know maybe some of these this, that's where all the gold all the uranium every element you have ever come from including every cell in your body has come from supernovas that's the factory that makes elements so if there was a location somewhere else that had bigger stars multiple stars that burped out more heavy elements than you know our local system did maybe this is common and you can find stable 115 like we mined for gold on you know on our planets or uranium it just depends if they were lucky enough to have exotic materials like that i find that easier to believe than somebody built a machine to manufacture such a difficult material so it's sort of like a rorschach test aha they made 115 he was right it really does exist somebody who doesn't want to believe it says 115 doesn't behave anything like Bob Lazar said. It's sitting around in a pile of 500 pounds or something, right? I mean, it's sort of like that. What is the... Right. You have to... I mean, you just have to start accumulating whether you believe it or not. And I personally, again, I prefer you don't believe it. <laughs> um, you know, just begin accumulating the facts that you can, you know, you can verify. And, um, and really be careful. But that drives them crazy. I mean, That's you need fine. to answer this. Now, I need an answer. How much? How many times do you get that in a, in a week still after all this oh, time? Oh, I get, you I get, there isn't that. a day I, I don't get emails. And, you know, I try and get this across to them. Look, I don't even want to talk about it anymore. You know, well, I don't believe the story. Great, pass it around. <laughs> you know, I really don't want you to because it makes life difficult for me. I'm trying to do serious research. I'm, you know, I've got contract with governments and other companies for... R&D work and aside from you know other scientific interests and I want this divorced look if I went and did everything I can to prove my story and reached a tipping point for where people like Stanton Friedman and you know people uh, uh, along those lines um, said you know what this is beginning to look factual do you know how that would annihilate me that would destroy my business it would make it impossible for me to operate and, you know, I'd have a continuous flow of questions, annoying people, I'm sure offers to do things that I am not the least bit interested in. Which so, is how it was for years. Yeah. It was for years, yeah. right? Look, I could have jumped on all that stuff. I could have, you know, at Area 51 sports drinks, and I could have been giving, look how many lectures. At one point I had, uh, what's that talk show host that... Uh, Oh, what's the guy's name? Which one? Raldo, suspenders. Montel. Um, old Harold guy, Lever? Suspenders. Larry King. Larry King. Yeah, he, I mean, I had an open invitation at one time for that show to come on. As the, you know, Geraldo, everybody, you know, I turned down everything. Montel Williams. I blew off movie scripts. I blew off all kinds of stuff because they couldn't stick to facts. Is there a part of you, though, that there's got to be part of you somewhere in there, even though it would be counterproductive there's got to be part of you that wishes god damn it I, I know what happened it's true no look i know what happened is true there's no doubt period there's there's no delusion and there are some things i can say that that will bolster the case and i'm not going to um it's going to stay that way i do regret at this point bringing anything forward Look, at the time, I'm in my early 20s. I went, you know what? This is a crime against the American people. This is just BS, and everybody deserves to know what's going on. You know, and 25 years goes by, you get a little older, and your priorities change. And, you know, what they told me is, this is a security matter, and really, what's the public going to do without this? You know how reactionary they are? It's, there's a bunch of different reasons this is being kept quiet. Nothing that they'd bother telling me, but the bottom line is they're right. The bulk of the people are complete morons, and I'm sorry. Maybe they are right, and this really should just be just be information that's handled out on a on a need-to-know basis to some people. Right? There's no. I'm not out for any fame. I really have better things to do. Generally, people have to twist my arm to come out and do things like that as you know you're the arm twister <laughs> those who were around him at the time the story broke or took the trips into the desert to see the craft fly above s4 say you really had to be there there's a mufon moron that calls me every once in a while and he says we well, don't still believe that guy do you and i say i lived it 
It, the whole two years, it was fantastic. It was one of the greatest times of my life. He wouldn't go through the trouble to make up a story to lie to people and then perpetuate that lie. Bob has no idea who won the Super Bowl or the World Series last year, do you? I mean, he's busy doing scientific stuff in, in the Bob Lazar world. He, he wouldn't waste his time perpetrating a lie on anyone. Look, I know what happened is true. There's no doubt, period. Lazar was known to have unconventional interests and a spotty financial record, so why would a top-secret program let him in? One theory is that maybe someone predicted he would spill the beans and was chosen because they wanted the UFO story to be planted. Lazar told us he can't rule that out entirely. We're putting together a special Area 51 section on our website, and we'll be adding material to it over the next few days, including extended excerpts with the most recent interview. And by For base only a handful of times, but began to get scared. I began to get worried in that, boy, they've given me all this classified information. They're not calling me anymore. They won't take my phone calls. And in the meantime, apparently they're deciding what to do with me. Look at how bright it's getting. Look at it now. For a variety of personal reasons, Lazar couldn't keep the story to himself. He shared his tale with John Lear and Gene Huff. They and a few others made treks out to the outskirts of S4 because Lazar said he'd learned when the test flights of the saucer would take place. Three weeks in a row, a glowing object appeared over the mountain. Look at how bright it's getting. Look at it now. And just a few minutes ago, we saw one of the government uh, uh, extraterrestrial UFOs. The time when Bob said there would be a test, there was a strange light jumping around in the sky above the location where he said it would be at the time and date he said it would be. You know, here, the craft took off when I said it was taking off from past the, the mountain range, which was Papoose Lake, S4, south of Area 51, you know, in a restricted area. So it's not like anyone was out there with a model plane or anything. And, uh, you know, flew around did incredible maneuvers that impressed everybody to the point where we got scared and got behind a, a, a car, fearing the thing was going to explode. But um, really, how do you explain it? It's bright right now. Lazar has more than his share of critics, including the poobahs of the UFO community who think he made it up. And he um, they all have one proton, which makes them hydrogen. Now, this is true for all elements. You can have the amount of protons in them determines what element it is. So element 115 has 115 protons in it. It's element 115. Now, depending on the number of neutrons it has, it will still be element 115, but it can be any number of isotopes of it. 115 undoubtedly has, you know, many isotopes of it. We've synthesized 115. We made one isotope. We have a radioactive one. Now they just need to continue on working with it. I mean, they made just a few atoms, but uh, we'll see what other isotopes they come up with. One of them or more is going to be stable and it will have the exact properties that or, I said. Or could we make it? Or does it have to be natural? As you speculated about that. Well, before. it's natural. It would be difficult to find it. I, I do not think you can make that synthetically. It's just it takes too much time. I mean, to make you know, an ounce of it or even a gram would take a tremendous amount of time because not all the interactions are successful. I mean, you can bang particles together all day long and one may get stuck and then you've got an atom and how do you contain you know this single atom so how do we get 500 pounds of it where'd that come from well it, it, it had to either be uh, synthesized by the extraterrestrials that bought it in the first place or this research I'm you know I've got contract with governments and other companies for R&D work and aside from you know other scientific interests and I want this divorced Look, if I went and did everything I can to prove my story and reached a tipping point for where people like Stanton Friedman and, you know, people uh, uh, along those lines um, said, you know what, this is beginning to look factual. Do you know how that would annihilate me? That would destroy my business. It would make it impossible for me to operate. And, you know, I'd have a continuous flow of questions, annoying people, I'm sure offers to do things that I am not the least bit interested in. Which is so, how it was for years. Yeah. It was for years, yeah. right? Look, I could have jumped on all that stuff. I could have, you know, at Area 51 sports drinks, and I could have been giving, look how many lectures. At one point I had, uh, what's that 
talk show host that, uh, oh, what's the guy's name? Which one? Raldo, Suspenders. Montel. And, um, Old oh, guy suspended. Larry King. Larry King. Yeah, he. I mean, I had an open invitation at one time for that show to come on. As the, you know, Geraldo, everybody, you know, I turned down everything. Montel Williams. I blew off movie scripts. I blew off all kinds of stuff because they couldn't stick to facts. Is there a part of you, though, that there's got to be part of you somewhere? It's why in, in a zero gravity environment, flame is a ball, obviously. There's nothing to pull things around. But anyway, if. Uh, Look, if you negate the gravity around it, why is it still pointy? How can it still be making light? And why doesn't it move? Well, I mean, he, from what Barry said, it's not just gravity, but it's also time locked. You've they distorted froze the. Frame of time. Yeah, they right. essentially froze a, a, a piece of time there. And I, you know, what do you say? I mean, you're, it's empirical evidence. You're looking at it's it. It's not, it's that not you a. Could see it. it doesn't make sense that you could see it. And uh, uh, look, it. it the stuff I saw there was the most unbelievable, literally, because it, it, it defied what, what we knew as physics. And uh, at least I thought it did. And maybe what we knew was <laughs> a little incorrect and just needed viewing from a different angle. They finally did uh, synthesize element 115 that had the properties that I, that I stated. Um, not um but it wasn't stable yeah it wasn't stable uh now each element has isotopes for instance you know let's talk about hydrogen we're all familiar with hydrogen uh hydrogen has three isotopes they're all hydrogen there's hydrogen protium was the, be the technical name deuterium and tritium well tritium is a radioactive and maybe spend a few minutes staring at the paintings you picked up at the area 51 art show while perhaps listening to the bob lazar music video the story that bob lazar told 25 years ago this week has gone around the world many times over inspiring books and tv shows and movies who knew that indiana jones warehouse is at area 51 that sound you hear means Agent Black will be waiting for you. You're too nice. <laughs> Another repository of Area 51 lore is the exhibit at the Atomic Testing Museum. While in town recently for our interview, <laughs> Lazar took the tour. I guess I have to get a picture of that, too. It was a little surreal watching Bob Lazar as he saw tape of the first interviews he ever gave about his time working at S4. Later, as we plowed through boxes of paperwork about his claims, Lazar reiterated his preference that people don't believe his story. Look. I am not out there giving UFO lectures, producing tapes. I, this is not a business of mine. I am trying to run a scientific business. Um, and if I'm the UFO guy, it makes it really difficult. It's to my benefit that people don't believe the story. These I, days, Lazar and his wife operate a scientific supply firm in Michigan. He's received media coverage because of the odd stuff he sells online, but not everyone has made the connection to Area 51. An international sensation. He's here with an update. Uh, setting the stage, Dave, you might not know this, but uh, 25 years ago, a young anchor woman <laughs> named Paula Francis and I were prepping for the 5 o'clock news when we learned that our scheduled live interview had canceled. We placed a call to aviator John Lear to ask if he could get a friend of his to fill the spot, a guy who reportedly worked out near Area 51 and had seen flying saucers out there. It sounded outrageous at the time, but that interview with Bob Lazar turned Area 51 upside down. We coaxed a reluctant Lazar into returning to Las Vegas to talk about it. I don't know. Sometimes I really do regret it, regret it and almost I, I almost feel like apologizing to him, saying that, you know, I'm sorry I let things out. Can I have my job back? 25 years after he was forever transformed into Bob the UFO guy, Bob Lazar says he regrets ever talking about flying saucers or a secret base in the Nevada desert or any of the things that made his name known all over the world. If there isn't a day I, I don't get emails and, you know, I try and get this across to him. Look, I don't even want to talk about it anymore. You know, well, I don't believe the story. Great, pass it around. <laughs> you know, I really don't want you to because it makes life difficult for me. A quarter century ago, not many people outside of Nevada had ever heard of Area 51, the mysterious base 100 miles north of Las Vegas, a place the government said didn't exist. It was the location of choice for all manner of black projects.